My next guest is a fellow warrior, a transplant from California who's been on Conversations before. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Dr. Carol Swain. This is the show where I get to invite the guests. I pick the topics. I can talk about anything I want to talk about with anyone. My guest today is a familiar face, Roger Simon. Roger is a Academy Award nominated playwright. He's a novelist. He's a editor, he's a lot of things. And so I'm not gonna to try to say all these things because Roger can speak for himself. And so Roger, welcome back. Well, great to be here, Carol. It's always fun just to talk to you and uh, to do it live on TV makes it more interesting. And I have to be more careful about what I say. But anyway. You don't have to be careful about what you say because this is a show where you can be yourself and you can pour out your soul and say anything you wanna say. All and right. we're so glad you moved from California to Nashville, and you're part of, I know you're not deeply religious, but God's plan to save the nation. Well, I'm beginning to believe it. I <laughs> guess, you know, as you get older, you, these things have become more important to you naturally. And, you know, I, it's interesting because I come here and I, I'm half tempted for the Epic Times to write about Tennessee affairs, but mostly I write about national, international stuff because that's, a, that's what they want out of me. And, re, and recently I've been, because things are pretty desperate in our country, they're pretty extreme. We've been going through a period like, I think we've never really have since the Civil War. Uh, most recently, I, I wrote an article about uh, whether the United States should break up into two countries, red and blue. I, that is you know, so something I never thought I would even consider. But let me ask you this, uh, Roger, as far as uh, Tennessee, mm -hmm. isn't Tennessee like a microcosm of the rest of the world? And you know, Na Nashville itself is an immigrant receiving city. Mm -hmm. uh, there was enough Kurdish people here mm -hmm. um, like 20 years ago for them to vote in an, in, in an election. And so for, for their president, for Saddam Hussein or whatever, so they could vote and so, when you write about Nashville, you can really write about the nation because... Uh, oh, I, I think that's absolutely true. And uh, now we and have all Tennessee these... in general as well, because, you know, we're sitting on the edge of... We're in Davidson County on the edge of Williamson County. I mean, it's kind of an amazing dichotomy when you... It's like you're crossing the border from blue to red, back and forth. It's, uh, and it's, it, is, it is symbolic of but America. But there's something else, too, is that it seems like the political left, they have a strategy of turning all the red states into blue states. And I think that's why so many uh, immigrants are being sent into the red states, being strategically placed. And so you, do you live in Williamson County? No, I live in Davidson, but I live very Bless close to Williamson. I'm in Williamson <laughs> half the time. <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm really, but they're I'm, taking I'm over by Williamson coastal. County. Said, they're taking it over. Uh, yeah, yes, well, no, it's quite clear what you're saying is true, that the, that the left is trying to, to subvert the, the, the red states. They're, they certainly did a great job with Georgia during the last election. And I, w I went down to Georgia a lot to cover it for the uh, Epic Times. I went down to Atlanta a couple of times. And I'll tell you that the leadership of the GOP in Georgia might as well be Democrats. Well, I mean, uh, and, uh, I could say the same thing about some of t uh, Tennessee because yes. I've been disappointed with our leadership. And I think it's because we have open primaries. That's part of it. And another part of it is, you know, someone explained it to me, because I, as you said, I'm a newcomer still relatively three years, uh, that <laughs> the Republicans are really o the old Southern Democrats wearing new hats. And yeah. I th I said, when I heard that, I went, uh-huh, yes, that's exactly. I started thinking about Robert Penn Warren novels and the old things about uh, politics of the old South that I read when I was in college. And uh, it's, it's interesting, it hasn't changed all that much, it's just wearing new suits. I'm, I'm interested in the article you wrote about the uh, country breaking into red and blue states, but first I wanna say something about what I've observed about Tennessee politics. 
it seems as if there is a, an elite that they get together from both political parties and they decide who our leaders are going to be and that when we vote, sometimes it's like we're going through the motions because the elites in both political party, they've already selected the leaders. Absolutely. And I think that's a paradigm of the United States in general. So in fighting it in Tennessee, you're fighting it in the country. So, so uh, right but, about Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Tennessee is, an, is, is just a, an example of what's going on everywhere. Although if you take something like California, it's a bit more extreme. But, but here it is exactly that. And the vote, I, but I sense, particularly from women because of uh, the rise of things like critical race theory in the schools, that a rebellion is beginning to occur. It is. And, and that's really great. And you I, can stir the pot. Help me stir the pot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I intend to do. But, you know, it's really interesting to see it happen. And you can see it happening on a real grassroots basis. Uh, and you can see a real nervousness in the politicians, too, which is kind of interesting. Because they like to control things, and we're become, yeah. becoming uncontrollable. I mean, you know, I think people enter politics in this and many other states as a way to enrich themselves, get famous and powerful, and blah, blah, blah. That's so unfortunate. It's terribly unfortunate, but I think that's the reality. And, and you know, Nancy Pelosi is a paradigm for politicians across the country. Right. I mean, she, if, you, if you drive by her vineyard in Napa Valley, which is on Silverado Trail, which is like the most high-priced real estate probably in the entire globe, you know, what, you know that H.L. Mencken was correct when he said famously, when somebody says it's not about the money, it's about the money. For sure. Yeah. So this uh, op-ed article about us breaking into red states and blue states, what do we do if all those people that have moved from California into the red states, uh, you know, and I say that very deliberately trying to change the culture, will we change them or will they change us? Good question. Uh, I deal with that a little bit. You know, this was only a, a thousand word or whatever it was article. and. I, I was experimenting with it because I'm, I do that sometimes in the Epic Times too because they have very smart readership and I'm very curious to see what they're going to say because this is an idea we have to all look at. Even if we don't believe we should do it, we should look at the, because of these migrations that are going on for different reasons. People are, people are flowing into Tennessee, Texas and so forth from California and other blue states for a variety of reasons. The taxes is an obvious one. But then they want to raise the taxes at the Democrats. Yeah, yeah. The, some of them do and some of them uh -huh. don't. I, I, I think that the fear that people justifiably and that you are expressing have is that they're going to bring their blue state ways to red states isn't as entirely true as we think it is. Now, I wrote that and I got pushback. because. From home. It, from readers, uh -huh. and, and, and the pushback that the readers gave, and these are readers who know red states well, was that I live in a bubble, and I go to meetings, and I meet people who come from California for the reasons I did. But you know those people, and so you know how they think. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. There, there are two different groups that are moving, very basically, more than that, but basically, they're, they, you know, they're, there's a group that will end up subverting America, and then there is a group that are leaving these blue states because they love America, and, and it's it, uh, you know Glenn Reynolds, the Institute who lives here in Knoxville, is starting a group called Welcome Ragged. Well, hold that thought because yeah, we need to take a break, and we'll pick up on that after uh, this uh, word from my sponsor. Conversations with Dr. Carol Swain is made possible by Cooper Steel, a family-owned business that provides the steel fabrications for some of the greatest buildings across the United States. 60 years ago, Kenneth and Faye Cooper founded their company in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Cooper Steel believes in sponsoring Carol Swain because we believe she does. You build strong, you stand strong. What started as a vision and now a nationally recognized and operated company that remains true to its founders' Judeo-Christian values and principles. 
Cooper Steel is committed to excellence, responsibility, and community. Cooper Steel's motto is, build strong, stand strong. They treat their employees and customers like family. Thank you to Cooper Steel for standing strong with conversations with Dr. Carol Swain. Learn more about our generous sponsor at coopersteel.com. Black Eye for America is enlightening the nation. I would definitely encourage people to buy the book to learn a little bit more about what critical race theory is actually rooted in, Marxism. Buy the book at bethepeoplenews.com or wherever books are sold. Just so we can have logical and practical conversations with people who are getting misinformation and disinformation from social media, from their friends. Now an Amazon bestseller and available on Kindle. Absolutely. It's a must-read book. I'm back with my guest, Roger Simon. And so, Roger, tell me about uh, this. Uh, Welcome wagon? Yes. Well, Glenn's <laughs> idea is that a group is set up to welcome the people coming from the blue states to the red states. Does, and, is it going to have a Bible in the packet? <laughs> well, uh, hopefully a Bible, but they'll also explain to them how we do things here and why. <laughs> so that they, in other words, to head them off at the pass uh -huh. before they bring their blue state waves. Uh, uh, you know, but uh, I've met many who aren't. Is it ways or values? Well, <laughs> well either same. way, it's both. Mm -hmm. Because the values create the ways. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, it, it, it's obviously both, we mean the same thing. So it's to, to stop them from bringing these values. Show them the consequences that we are low, uh, you know, taxes. We yeah. used to be low crime, except in Nashville and uh, Memphis and wherever the Democrats are in control. Yeah, the crime situation is terrible. It's, it's, I mean, it's bad here now. And it, but, I mean, it's not, I, I was recently in LA because I was out there covering the Larry Elder campaign and that is frightening. You're really worried about crime everywhere you go. It's really bad. Also in New York, it's, it's not. I mean, in both cities I've been to recently, and I grew up in New York and lived most of my life in L.A., and they're not the same places. Is it because the uh, police have um, backed away or that they have not uh, funded police adequately? And then the people that you talk with that are natives of those areas, do they want protection or do they think they can fend for themselves? They don't like guns either, I know. Yeah, they don't like guns, but they want protection. They're <laughs> schizophrenic. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, everybody wants protection. And, and in the minority communities, of course, they want protection more because it's where the crime is. Right. I mean, the whole thing is nuts. Except when it spills over into the other areas. No, of course. Does it ever? And, you know, in California now, uh, the rule is if you, if you don't steal over $1,000 worth of goods, they just let you walk into a, a Target or a 7-Eleven and take whatever you want. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, it's the opposite of, of Giuliani's broken windows plan that worked for New York in those years. I mean, it's, kind of, it's really well, sad. Started. It's kind of moral narcissism that I write about in my, my old book. You know, I, I think people that started view. with Obama. And the reason I'm going to say with Obama, that was when I first started seeing articles about gangs and groups of young people going into the mall and helping themselves to whatever was on the shelves, yeah, yeah. and no one pursued them. And so they got away with those crimes. And then I will argue that the lawlessness can be traced to how we treated illegal immigration. When you start ignoring one set of laws, other people watch uh, people get away with committing crimes and it encourages them to participate. But it was during the Obama years that I thought you saw at least more and more minority youth willing to go into stores, go to the mall, commit crimes of theft, and no one well, seemed to pursue thing. it. Yeah, no. it's such a misplaced value system. It's it's so sad because, uh, you know, the elitist white person in this instance is thinking when a black kid breaks into a store, oh, he's a poor black kid and he came from a neighborhood and he didn't get to have a 40-inch TV or whatever he didn't get to have. <laughs> that is so mean to that kid. I know. That's the irony of it. It's vicious. It's so racist. It's pathetic. I mean, everything is flipped in our head in our, in our culture right now. Well, let me ask you what you think about this. The fact that um, the Democrats don't want landlords to receive rents, and so 
they think if you own property that the person that's occupying your property should be able to do so free and you can't pursue it. That has to hurt a lot of Democrats. It hurts anyone, you know, that's renting. So why would they do something as illogical as that? Well, again, it's that I think that that's a crazy misplaced value system. It, it, it's, it's so much, it, some call it virtue signaling, of course, but I wrote about it in terms of a much more kind of psychoanalytic thing in my book, I Know Best. I wrote about it mm -hmm. and I called it, called it moral narcissism. I mean, it, it's, it's a complete disconnect between what you say you believe in and the reality of what happens. The reality of what happens is to be completely ignored. It's only what you say that's important. It's a very weird way of living and also has terrible implications for their own children. I mean, the racism is obvious, but also the kids uh, of these elite ones are, are, are deeply depressed and in trouble. You see it all over California, particularly. Another thing, Roger, um, and I want you to talk about the Larry Elder uh, race and the recall, but there's so many things that, to me, it just doesn't make sense the reasoning of the political left, because I think the average American has common sense. You know, they may be a Democrat or Republican, but they're not on board with their leaders. So why does it make sense for, it doesn't make sense, for the Democrats to approach governing the way they do? Well, it's about money and power. I think they really want to keep their money and power so much that they're willing to disconnect all that stuff. And I think it's, there's a level of self-hypnosis going on, too. I mean, they convince themselves they are the good ones. And it's, it's, it's crazy, of course, but it, they do it. You know, the, the California recall election was very strange. I mean, of course, you have to write off. A, a, there's a certain level of corruption that goes on in these elections all the time. And it certainly went on in this one. But, but, the, but the numbers were rather skewed toward toward uh, Gavin Newsom and more than, I think more than could be covered by corruption, although uh, no way of ever knowing. Well, I mean, Biden, for example, went there and said that if you elected him, you were electing Donald Trump and mm -hmm. implied that he was so evil, he's gonna do all these things to women. And then this whole idea that he was a model minority, which used to be applied to Asians, uh, and he was being controlled by white supremacists, uh, <laughs> and that he himself was a white supremacist. Well, you know, you, you see a it, black the, white supremacist. The Los Angeles Times called him a white supremacist. I mean, the Los Angeles Times. Is, I mean, and I used to my, I used to write for the Los Angeles well, here's Times. Here's my theory on that: is that you know, like I wrote a book back in 2002, the new white nationalism in America, and at that time. Uh, true KKK, neo-Nazis, real racists were minuscule. Mm -hmm. And so if you use the traditional definition of white supremacists, a white person who believed that they were superior because of their race and ethnicity, you'd have nobody. So what they've done is encompass all white people, <laughs> white supremacists exactly. now, and black people who defend, you know, mm -hmm. equality and rights, all of a sudden, we are white supremacists as well. <laughs> That's what happened to Larry. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a horrible thing. I mean, it's the, I, I couldn't, you know, I was, as you probably know, I was in the civil rights movement. That was my first trip to the South, really, years and years ago, 1966. Uh, I would never have dreamed, dreamed that it was going to go this way. I mean, one wonders what Dr. King would think. I mean, because everything is the opposite of what he said. He's been canceled. Definitely canceled. <laughs> I mean, the last thing the left wants is to be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. Yeah, that's for sure. They definitely want to be judged by the color of their skin. Their skin. What a, I mean, Joseph Goebbels would nod his head in approval. I mean, that's, that's exactly what the Nazis said, in it, just with different groups re re replacing each other. I mean, you just change the names and you got it. What really uh, bothers me is that I love America and I don't want to be uh, anti-American, but when I see the things that we've done, what we did in Afghanistan, what we allowed with the gain of function research and the collaboration with the Wuhan lab, mm -hmm. when I see NIH experimenting you know, with human animal 
um, embryos, creating new life forms. And when I look at abortion and all of these things that we're doing in this country, uh, so much of it is evil. And it makes me wonder, like, who we are as Americans. And I want you to respond to that. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a big we, one. We have to go uh, to a break. And <laughs> I also want you in this next segment, which will be our last segment, to go into detail about you know your thoughts about what we can do um, to save America. <laughs> we'll be back. Dr. Carol Swain's Be the People, a call to reclaim America's faith and promise, newly released in paperback and audio with a new introduction, is a challenge to all Americans. If you are serious about being the best citizen you can be, this is the book for you. From addressing moral relativism to reclaiming the future, you'll understand why Dr. Swain is one of the most relevant voices in today's culture war. Are you ready to reclaim America's faith and promise? Purchase at bethepeoplenews.com front slash books or wherever books are sold. Cooper Steel is a family-owned business that provides the steel fabrications for some of the greatest buildings across the United States. 60 years ago, Kenneth and Faye Cooper founded their company in Shelbyville, Tennessee. What started as a vision and now a nationally recognized and operated company that remains true to its founders' Judeo-Christian values and principles. Cooper Steel's motto is, build strong, stand strong. Thank you to Cooper Steel for standing strong with conversations with Dr. Carol Swain. I'm back with Roger Simon. So I ended with telling you how I'm struggling. I don't want to be anti-American. Um, so, you know, what, I do, what do I do and what should we as Americans do? Well, you and I do a certain thing. We speak to the public. But, and I, you and know, we speak and the we, truth. <laughs> and we, yeah, hopefully we do. And we've been doing it all our lives, really. But we're only part of this, the picture. I think the answer is going to come on the grassroots. And it's got to come in those grass It's got to be those people that are fighting critical race theory in the schools right now. Those are the people where the greatest hope is with. I consider myself part of the grassroots. I mean, my background, high school dropout. Oh, I'm not talking about your background. Which yeah, but is, I mean. Is, of course it's grassroots, your background. But you're a public figure now. You're, you're, you're a pundit. You're a writer. You're, you have a... Uh, show all this. Now, all that's great. I'm not. I'm not denigrating what you do or I do. I, you were asking a different question, which is, where is the greatest hope? And I think it's it the is, people rising up. Uh, and and you know, my brand uh, when I'm not conversations with Dr. Carol Swain is be the people, be the people, the we the people, standing up. And yeah. so that's what has to happen, and, and it is happening, isn't it? Yeah, it's happening, and we. we it's our job to encourage it as much as we can. But, but it's the job of the people to really do it. <laughs> and and uh, I find very interesting and valuable to go to meetings, uh, my wife does a lot, the uh, meetings of the, of, of the people, of people that you don't know from the media, whose names we don't know, like the city but council are out people. there. So the people that go to city council member meetings and stand up and wait to speak. Those are the people who are going to change America, and I sure hope they do. I mean, and we all got to encourage those people. We in the media have to encourage those people like crazy. How do we encourage those people? What well, we talking right about them and tell them they're doing a great That's job. I, and they're, yeah. We tell them. Right. We, we get, help them tell that story. Everybody, exactly. Everybody wants praise, and, you know, they deserve praise. They deserve praise for doing this because it's hard. I mean, they're giving up parts of their lives. They all have children, jobs, all the rest of that. And, if, if, you know, this is what the founders intended. I know. And maybe it can happen again, because that well, we need a second revolution. It, we, didn't Jeff, I, I keep looking for that quote right. from Jefferson. I can't find it, but probably been hidden by uh -huh. Google. But, <laughs> well, surely. But, you know, the idea that a country needs a revolution every certain amount of years, and I think we do need a kind of revolution. I hope it's not a violent one, because and who I knows? You, I don't want everybody to die. <laughs> but, but, but we need a, a, a spiritual revolution. And you know, you, you chide well, we me need, a little bit about not being religious enough. But I another think that's awakening. What it, what's that? Another great awakening. Yes. And, you know, people have to be willing, uh, you know, to die for a cause. 
And my position has been, you know, like we all, we're not going to get out of this world alive. No. Uh, and so <laughs> there's nothing to fear when it comes to standing for principle, because this is the time for people to think about uh, their descendants and what's going to happen for their children and grandchildren if we don't stand. And I am encouraged because there are a lot of um, older people, you know, that are standing, but there are also younger people and uh, kids are standing up. And so I think we will have that revolution that they will have to deal with us. They can't dismiss all of us. But I'm afraid, you know, lives will be lost, not just through government um, manipulation of, of, of crises like COVID, where they restrict information that could save lives. Uh, right. The government, um, it, I don't know if you remember the name of the author who wrote the book, uh, How to Kill 11 Million People. <laughs> yeah, we, but the thing about it is that governments throughout time, they have been willing to allow their citizens to die or to kill their citizens. And when we think about America, we think, oh, no, that yeah, can never they? happen here. But our nation is exposing itself. And it's not, um, you know, the nation that I grew up in. We are being uh, led by people who are evil. I would say they believe the ends justify the means. They're globalists. They have alliances, I say, with foreign uh, entities. Uh, and we can't trust those leaders. Not at all. In fact, it is, we have to oppose and fight them at every turn. And we have to, it's our job here. And, and we have cur need courage because if they take one of us out, Ten should pop up, <laughs> in the, to, or more, to well, replace you know, the one you, they take out. <laughs> uh, well, I hope so. And, and that's sort of the way the church, when the persecution happened, that was when it really flourished. I mean, <laughs> people stood up, and people. Uh, so it's something about persecution that uh, gives backbones to people. You know, it, it does, and maybe you know, there's always a good way of looking at things. And like the defeat in California that just occurred, yeah, I'm, may be actually better than a victory, in that it 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 has a bigger lesson than a victory. I mean, people say even in sports, Novak Djokovic, the tennis player, always claimed uh, every time he lost, he learned more than when he won. What did we learn from California other than that we learned that the Democrats are still racist and they have a double standard and they're willing to cheat. What else did we learn? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Those, that's a lot though. I mean because that's a, it's important to be reminded of that at every turn. But the other, but the other thing we may have learned is we've got to fight harder. But I, I mean, I, I mean, even if they cheat, sometimes he, I, I feel like we, as uh, Republicans or conservatives, that we get outwitted, and I think part of it is because most of us are not willing to look you in the eye and lie, but the other side is willing to lie and manipulate, and people can't wrap their minds around the fact that people can look you in the eye and lie. Yes, because they were taught not to do that from childhood. But, you know, maybe we're going to have to learn to be a little more evil ourselves. Well, I, don't, I hate to say I, that. Well, here's what I'll, I'll, I'll say it in a nicer way. Okay. You. Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals and, you know, get past the uh, dedication to Lucifer and open up the book. Right. And so he advocated infiltration, deception, and manipulation. Yeah. I think that we definitely have to infiltrate every organization and we, some of us have to keep our heads down low until we're strategically placed. And as far as uh, deception, like we, no one wants to be a deceiver, yet in the Bible there was plenty of times people use subterfuge. I like subterfuge and deception may mean the same thing, but I like the sound of subterfuge better. And so, um, so sometimes, you know, you don't reveal your hand, you keep it secret and you know, maybe that's where the idea of the noble lie comes from. You get the last word, uh, and you well, can tell I, people I, how to contact I would, you. The, my last word is I totally agree with that. <laughs> and the other part about it, the other part about it is, though, I got bad news for you and me. Uh -huh. It comes a subterfuge. We're out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but there are people that have not uh, yeah, know. <laughs> may expose themselves. So yes, we have to. We have to uh, quietly whisper in their ears. <laughs> <laughs> they just need courage, and it's such an honor to have you on the show again. It's always fun. Uh, and you are a treasure, an American treasure. Well, likewise. Well, thank you. you.
Um, and thank you for this terrific book, which, by the way, is something we should all, and people like me should learn for, from, too. That is, when there's a big issue on the table like this, right. get it out fast and get it into the public's hands. They need it. They, yeah, that it, was for the grassroots th people. Th this is the way Thomas Paine used to do it. All right. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. Many ask, why should I care about critical race theory? I'm Dr. Carol Swain, and along with Dr. Christopher Shore, we've authored a new book, Black Eye for America, How Critical Race Theory is Burning Down the House. Every American should care about CRT because this radical Marxist philosophy is dividing our country and taught to our children, but we're going to stop it. Endorsed by Dr. Ben Carson, Black Eye for America is a playbook on combating CRT. Thank you so much for tuning in. Wasn't Roger Simon awesome? I love having him on the show. And you can follow his writings at the Epic Times, and you can go to Amazon or some bookstore and find some of his 13 books. He is an American treasure, and I hope to have him back on soon. And so for you, uh, do your part to fight for America and tune in next week and tell your friends and neighbors about uh, conversations with Dr. Carol Swain. Follow me on social media. Thanks.